Hello, welcome to your Chapter 4 lecture on tissues. Throughout the semester, you will appreciate the saying, with form comes function. This basically means that if the student really learns the form of a particular system or organ, then the student should be able to guess or deduce the function of that system or organ. Organs are made up of at least two different tissues. But what is a tissue? A tissue is a group of cells that performs a common function. There are four main tissue types in the body. This lecture is to introduce you to these four tissues and their subcategories. The pictures on this slide are showing you one type of tissue, muscle. The top right picture shows smooth muscle, which is found within the wall of the digestive tract, and the bottom left picture shows cardiac muscle cells. So, as I said in the previous slide, we are exploring tissues, a group of closely associated cells that perform related functions and are similar in structure. There are only four different types of tissue in the human body. Epithelium, which acts as a covering of the body or as a lining for our digestive tract. Nervous tissue is used to control the body and integrate information from the external environment. Third, connective tissue provides general support for the body. And lastly, muscle, which mostly provides movement through its contractile properties. I will speak primarily of epithelium and connective tissue in this PowerPoint, as nervous tissue and muscle will be presented in later lecture units. The pictures on this slide show nervous tissue, which is the top slide, and skeletal muscle on the bottom slide. Compare the skeletal muscle on this slide to the smooth muscle and cardiac muscle on the previous slide. You would be incorrect to think that tissues are composed only of cells. Between the cells is a non-living material called the extracellular matrix. Some tissues have very little extracellular matrix, such as epithelium, and other tissues, such as connective tissue, are known to have an abundant extracellular matrix. What is extracellular matrix? The matrix consists of the extracellular protein fibers and a fluid known as ground substance. This ground substance in normal tissues is clear, colorless, and similar in consistency to a viscous syrup, like maple syrup. Ground substance is sometimes referred to as the extracellular fluid, or interstitial fluid, or tissue fluid. The ground substance gets its syrup-like characteristic from the abundant proteoglycans. These are proteins with, with large sugar attachments. For example, hyaluronic acid. And there are also glycoproteins. These are sugars with large protein attachments. So let's summarize. Tissues consist of cells and the extracellular matrix around them. The extracellular matrix consists of protein fibers and a syrup-like ground, ground substance. Here's my analogy. If a cell were a house, then a group of houses in a neighborhood would be a tissue. In between each house, there are yards. The yards reflect the extracellular matrix. The fences in between the houses provide support and boundaries, much like the extracellular protein fibers and some yards also have pools or ponds, and this would be like the ground substance. Before we really get into this chapter, I want you to understand how we study tissues in this class. We study them histologically. That means we look at tissues under a microscope. Before a tissue can be observed under a microscope, it must be prepared. First, an organ is extracted from the body and cut up into smaller parts. These smaller parts are then frozen. The frozen solid mass can then be used in a microtome. Think of the meat slicer in a deli. And the microtome cuts off thin slices of the organ. These thin slices are then carefully picked up with a wet paintbrush and placed on a slide. The specimen is then fixed to the slide. This is a fancy way of making the specimen adhere to the slide permanently. The specimen is usually dehydrated during the fixation process. Some specimens are then artificially colored or stained to show details of the cells or extracellular matrix. 
Sometimes the staining process occurs before the fixing step. It all depends on the tissue type and the stain used. When the process is completely over, do you think the specimen looks anything like it did when it was in the body? No. And so when you look at these histological specimens under the microscope, they will be stained beautiful blues or yellows or pinks or purples, and you need to remember that they do not have these colors in vivo, which means within the, the living body. Also, depending on how the original organ was sliced, the specimen will look very different. Now is a good time to review your planes, sagittal, frontal, transverse. For example, a garden hose can be cut in half in a transverse manner, or it can be cut longitudinally. The first cut would generate a histological specimen that looks circular with a lumen. The second type of cut would generate a specimen that looked more like an elongated horseshoe. We went over this during the first day of class, remember? Let's now start the official discussion on tissues, beginning with epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue includes epithelia and glands. Glands are secretory structures derived from epithelia. An epithelium, singular, and epithelia, plural, is a layer of cells that covers an exposed surface or lines an internal cavity or passageway. Each epithelium is a barrier with specific properties. We find epithelia lining our digestive tract, respiratory system, reproductive system, urinary tracts, chest cavities, ab abdominal cavity, and blood vessels, just to name a few. Epithelia perform several essential functions that are listed in the last bullet of this slide. They provide physical protection from abrasion, dehydration, and destruction by chemical or biological agents. They control permeability or ion transport, secretion, and absorption. By this I mean any substance that enters or leaves the internal body has to cross an epithelium. Some epithelia are relatively impermeable, whereas others are permeable to compounds as large as proteins. The machinery to do this comes from proteins, and you know that gene expression dictates what proteins a cell will have. Epithelia also provide sensations as they are extensively innervated by sensory nerves. Specialized epithelial cells can detect changes in the environment and convey information about such changes to the nervous system. Lastly, epithelia, specifically gland cells or glandular epithelium, can produce specialized secretions. Examples would include the, sal the saliva your salivary glands produce. Some important characteristics of epithelia include 1. Cellularity. Epithelia are composed almost entirely of cells bound closely together by cell junctions. In other tissues, individual cells are often widely separated by extracellular material. 2. Polarity. An epithelium always has an exposed surface that faces the exterior of the body or some internal space. This is its apical side. It also has an attached base, or basal layer, where the epithelium is attached to adjacent tissues. The apical and basal layers differ in structure and function. Whether the epithelium contains a single layer or multiple layers of cells, the organelles and other cytoplasmic components are not evenly distributed between the exposed, attached the exposed or attached surfaces. This uneven distribution is what we mean by polarity. Third, attachment. The basal surface of a typical epithelium is bound to a thin basement membrane. The basement membrane is a complex structure created by the basal surface of the epithelium and the underlying connective tissue. The basement membrane consists of two primary components shown in this picture. It consists of a sheet of extracellular proteins. Reticular fibers are the other component, and these fibers are an interwoven framework that is tough and flexible. I like to think of this layer as the rebar and gunite used to make a pool. The rebar represent the reticular fiber framework, and the sheet of extracellular proteins are like the gunite that smooths over the rebar. 
Both are necessary to create an anchor for the pool into the ground, much like the basement membrane anchors the overlying cells to the connective tissue beneath. The basement membrane is circled in this picture. Avascularity is our fourth component. Epithelia do not contain blood vessels. Notice the blood vessel in this picture is in the connective tissue. Because the epithelium is avascular, epithelial cells must obtain nutrients by diffusion or absorption across the apical or basal surfaces. 5. Regeneration. Epithelial cells damaged or lost at the surface are continually being replaced through the division of stem cells within the epithelium. In areas of high friction or wear, the epithelium will be stratified to provide even more resistance. For example, the epidermis of your hands, feet, and body consists of stratified epithelium. Even the vagina of a mature woman has stratified epithelium. Note, the vagina of a young girl does not have stratified epithelium. Why? Well, she shouldn't be experiencing any, quote, friction at that age, right? The stratified layering comes at the onset of puberty. Young girls who are sexually molested with penetrating objects often experience a lot of internal damage. Their small size, the brute force of the pedophile, and the lack of stratified epithelium are the main reasons. 6. Lastly, adjacent epithelial cells are directly joined at many points by special, gel, special cell junctions. These junctions include adherence, desmosomes, tight junctions, and gap junctions. Please turn to your book to see a detailed picture of these contacts as I discuss them. First, I'll discuss tight junctions. These are belt-like junctions that extend around the periphery of each cell. I like to think of them as Ziploc, as the Ziploc of junctions. This zona occludens, which means belt that shuts off, prevents molecules from passing between the cells of the epithelial tissues. For example, when your stomach releases its hydrochloric acid and digestive protein, pepsin, you would not want these substances to leak between the individual cells and then digest your own stomach tissue, right? Next is the adherence junction. This layer is below the tight junctions and is also called the zona adherens. This layer is created by transmembrane linker proteins and serves to reinforce the tight junctions. Desmosomes are the main junctions to anchor cells together. To me, they remind me of structures similar to buttons on our shirts, whose job it is to anchor the two sides of our shirt together. They even look like buttons, with a little circular plaque with intermediate fibers and linker proteins acting like the thread that keeps the button on the shirt. Overall, this arrangement not only holds adjacent cells together, but also interconnects intermediate filaments of the entire epithelium into one continuous network of strong guy wires. The epithelium is thus less likely to tear when pulled on. Lastly, the gap junctions, also called a nexus, is a tunnel-like junction that occur anywhere along the lateral membranes. Gap junctions remind me of two adjoining hotel rooms. Did you ever stay at a hotel when your family or guests had to occupy multiple rooms? Was there ever a door in the middle of the room that you could open on your side and your family on the other side also had their own door they could open? If both doors were open and then if both doors were open, you could then walk from room to room without leaving the room and going into the hall, right? Well, this is precisely what gap junctions do. They provide a passageway for small molecules to pass through such to pass through such as ions, sugars, etc., without those substances having to be secreted out the apical layer of one cell only to be reabsorbed by the apical layer of the next cell. Gap junctions and desmosomes will be revisited when we discuss cardiac muscle. Many kinds of epithelium exist in the body. In classifying them, each epithelium is given two names. The first name indicates the number of cell layers in the epithelium, and the last name describes the shapes of the cells. With respect to cell layers, an epithelium is called simple if it has just one cell layer 
as seen in the top left picture. An epithelium is called stratified if it has more than one cell layer, as seen in the bottom left picture. When classifying cells by shape, the cells are squamous if they are flat cells, as shown in the top right picture. Cuboidal if they are shaped like cubes, as seen in the middle right picture. And columnar if they are taller than they are wide, as seen in the bottom right picture. In each case, the shape of the nucleus conforms to that of the cell. The nucleus of a squamous cell is disc-shaped. That of a cuboidal cell is spherical, and that of a columnar cell is an, oval elong is an oval elongated from top to bottom. Simple epithelia are easy to classify by cell shape because all cells in the layer usually have the same shape. In stratified epithelia, however, the cell shapes usually differ among the cell layers. To avoid ambiguity, stratified epithelia are named according to the shape of the cells in the apical layer. Simple epithelia have a single layer of cells. They are simple squamous, cuboidal, or columnar epithelia, and these are found only in protected areas in the body. They line internal compartments and passageways, including the ventral body cavities, the chambers of the heart, and all blood vessels. Simple epithelia are also characteristic of regions where secretion, absorption, or filtration occurs, such as the lining of the intestines and the gas exchange surfaces of the lungs. In these places, the thin single layer of simple epithelia is an advantage for it lessens the distance involved, and thus the time required, for materials to pass through or across the epithelial layer. So if you are looking at a simple epithelium, think of transport. In other words, there is only one cell layer for movement of a molecule, ion, or secretion to move through. If it is simple squamous, as shown at the top right of this slide, it allows for quick diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Yep, you guessed it. This slide shows the simple squamous epithelium lining the alveoli of the lung. If the tissue is simple cuboidal or columnar, you should think about secretions or absorption, like the salivary glands secreting saliva or the intestines absorbing nutrients, respectively. There are special cases of epithelium. It is epithelium, but with a special function. So these tissues get a different name. The lining in the heart and blood vessels comes from endothelium. The tissue that lines the serosal membranes is called mesothelium. Another special type of simple epithelia is called pseudostratified ciliated columnar, shown at the bottom right of this slide. It looks like it consists of many layers of cells and should be, quote, stratified. But the fact is, all of the cells are anchored to the basement membrane. Thus, it is truly a single layer of cells. What's a good analogy to help you with this? Well, think of a forest. All the living trees are rooted in the ground, but they are not the same height. Some trees create the tallest canopy, while smaller trees struggle to reach the top. That's exactly what you are seeing in the bottom right picture. Some cells are taller than others and extend over them, but all the cells are anchored in the basement membrane. Pseudostratified ciliated columnar is found in the trachea. Don't worry if you're panicking right now. Soon you will be a pro at, histolo at histology. Trust me. Simple cuboidal epithelium is found most abundantly in the kidney tubules and lining the ducts of glands such as sweat glands. Simple columnar epithelium is found mostly abund abundantly lining the gastrointestinal tract, starting with the stomach all the way to the anal canal. Stratified epithelia are usually found where mechanical stress is severe. Note in this photomicrograph the pink epithelial cells forming a series of layers. The surface of the skin and the lining of the mouth, throat, esophagus, rectum, and mature vagina and anus 
are areas where this epithelial type provides protection from physical and chemical attack. On exposed body surfaces where mechanical stress and dehydration are potential problems, the apical layers of epithelial cells are packed with filaments of the protein keratin. As a result, the superficial layers are both tough and water resistant, and the epithelium is said to be keratinized. See the keratin layer where the arrow is pointing? A non-keratinized stratified epithelium provides resistance to abrasion, but will dry out and deteriorate unless kept moist. Non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelia are found in the oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus, rectum, anus, and mature vagina. Stratified cuboidal and columnar epithelia are rare but are found in larger ducts of exocrine glands. Transitional epithelium lines the inside of the hollow urinary organs, such as the bladder. The bladder stretches as it fills with urine. As the transitional epithelium stretches, it thins from about six cell layers to three, and its apical cells unfold and flatten. This distension allows the bladder to fill over time and thus the epithelium transitions in shape. 